Hello, I'm Scott Meadow. There will be two people speaking. You will hear my voice and our guest. Everyone else will be muted. If you have trouble with audio, shut down programs running in the background or dial in by phone. Our presentation will last 60 minutes. Walter and I will speak and then we will take questions that you submitted. The webinar is being recorded for your convenience. I would like to thank the following people, Morgan Tommaso, Sharon Porta, Kara Kendall, Craig Schultz, Kathleen Quiebelman, Jane Rodriguez for making this event possible. Before we start, I want to take a moment to mention the passing of Professor Marvin Zonas, a friend, colleague, and neighbor of both Walter and myself. Marvin was a distinguished scholar and educator and trusted mem member and confidant to thousands of Booth students and faculty and is an irreplaceable member of our community. Back, back to happier topics. On behalf of Chicago Booth, Thank you all for joining us. We know you have unusual demands on your time and attention right now, and we appreciate your, your interest. I'm honored and pleased to introduce my friend and neighbor, Walter Massey, PhD, Senior Advisor to the President at the University of Chicago. Walter is President Emeritus of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and of Morehouse College, and as you know, the retired chairman of Bank of America. A prominent physicist, Walter has served as director of the Argonne National Laboratory, vice president for research and professor of physics at the University of Chicago. He also served as director of the National Science Foundation from 1991 to 1993. He has been provost and senior vice president for academic affairs of the University of California system where he was response for academic and research planning and policy, budget planning and programmatic oversight of three Department of Energy national laboratories. In the corporate sector, Walter has served as a director and chairman of Bank of America and a director of the First National Bank of Chicago, Delta Airlines, McDonald's, Amoco, and British Petroleum, and Motorola, among others. He's the recipient, he's the recipient, excuse me, of multiple honorary degrees. Additionally, throughout his academic career, Walter has been an advocate for issues surrounding minority students and education. Walter's recently published memoir, In the Eye of the Storm, My Time as Chairman of Bank of America During the World's Worst Financial Crisis is the behind the scenes story of the nation's greatest financial crisis in decades. Thank you for joining us this evening to discuss Walter's memoir. I'm sure you'll enjoy it as much as I when you purchase the book. His time with Bank of America and his varied and esteemed professional career and breadth of personal accomplishments will make for a very interesting next hour. Walter, in the prologue, you write that Eye of the Storm is just the first of many books you plan to write. Was there anything besides the anniversary of the financial crisis that prompted you to discuss to focus your first book on your time as chairman of Bank of America. How did, did you feel about revisiting that era when it was a source of so much stress and worry in your life? <laughs> thank you, Scott. And thank everyone for tuning in tonight and all of you who have put this together. I had been working on my, my memoirs for a number of years, almost a decade. And I'd actually finished, quote, uh, the memoirs, finished a version. I have a thick, thick stack 
a book that thick almost. But wh what I'd written was um, uh, kind of a chronology of my life. It wasn't a memoir in the sense that I, I mentioned. I, when I showed it to publishers, the reaction was, well, there's just so much in here. First of all, we need a theme to, that goes through it. And secondly, what you have said is sort of, you know, I did this, I was born, I did this, I did this, that you are not take, telling the reader how you felt at the time or really painting a picture of what it was like. Uh, that's, if you're not a writer, I believe that's not as easy as it might sound. So I did engage someone to help me do that. And then uh, the, the, it was the 10th anniversary and we had the idea why not just start with one facet of my career, a sort of a through line, you might say, and that would be a, a clothesline on which you could hang other stories. And so the Bank of America story became that story. And it was that it was the 10th anniversary also made it more relevant because there were so many articles being written about that crisis. An interesting thing with the title, almost as soon as we had the title and was advertising it, of course, we had the COVID crisis. And we thought, oh my goodness, this 19, uh, 2009 is not the greatest financial crisis anymore. I think the title is still accurate because it, it is says financial crisis. It doesn't say economic crisis. And this was, you know, it spread beyond the financial industry, but the locus of it was financial. So I, I'm comfortable with the title. Uh, I, there were frustrations, but there were also, there was also a great deal of satisfaction from having gone through this, which I tried to capture in the book. And so writing it was not taking me back to the most frustrating times. It allowed me to go back and revisit that time through other lenses of things that have happened since then. I started reading them, a memoir by a very accomplished author for the last couple of weeks. And she said, you know, writing a memoir is like rediscovering yourself. And in some days that's true because you are trying to say how you felt when you were 15 or 10 or even 30 for me or 40 through the eyes of someone who in their eighties. And of course you can never go back and really feel how you felt at that time. But it was, um, it was a joy doing it. And I'm very pleased. I've been getting very good reactions from people who have read it. So I'm well, glad no, I did it. <laughs> no, you, yeah, I'm glad you did it too. I've enjoyed it. Uh, but Walter, you're a physicist without a banking background, yet you spent many years on Bank of America's board of directors prior to being named chairman. Aside from ga gaining your fellow board members confidence, how did those years of participation on the board help in this particular time of crisis? When well, they're they very helpful. You? I was the longest serving uh, member of the Bank of America board at that time. I had joined the, what we call the legacy Bank America company in San Francisco in 1990, when it, 1994, 94. So I was the longest serving director. And then Bank of America San Francisco merged with Nations Bank and we became Bank of America. So that was very helpful. Also, I was not a complete novice to banking. I had all those years on Bank of America board, but I'd also served on the old First National Bank of Chicago board here in Chicago. And at that time, First Chicago was one of the uh, 10 largest banks in the country. That, that was before we had all the mega mergers. And interestingly uh, enough, as I also point out in the book, when I was on the old Fresh Chicago board, we had an episode with the Office of the Control of the Currency that was very reminiscent in many ways of, of what our encounter with the Fed at, when I was on the Bank of America, Chairman of Bank of America. So I knew things, I was familiar with the regulatory scene I was familiar with uh, issues that banks face and how bank boards operate. You know, it's a regulated industry and that's quite different from say a McDonald's or a Motorola. I learned, I, I did learn how to work or 
with my colleagues very well based on experience I had, not just on other corporate boards, but on not-for-profits. I was a trustee of the University of Chicago for a number of years, for example, and of Brown. And boards, I found, in many ways, are very similar, whether they are not-for-profit or for-profit or foundations or charitable organizations and the kind of dynamics one wants to achieve on a good, well-functioning board. That, that's very helpful. Walter, almost immediately after accepting the chairman position, you were called into a very serious meeting with the feds. After that, a series of crises followed. Criticism regarding the purchase of Merrill Lynch, selecting a new board, raising the 34 billion with a B required by the stress test, the CEO's resignation. What was the most difficult challenge through all those different varied events? Oh, so it's hard to say which one was the most difficult. For those who haven't read the book, I should mention how I became chairman. This was not a well-planned succession on the part of the bank. At that time, we had a CEO and chairman and one individual, as all the major corporations, most major corporations in America have. Uh, and when we purchased Merrill Lynch, it caused such, I guess, a backlash among our shareholders for a number of reasons. They thought we paid too much. They thought we had not been open with the shareholders about the, the problems that Merrill had. And, and other things, which I go into detail in, uh, in the book. And we had a shareholders meeting and the shareholders voted uh, to recommend to the company that they separate the positions of chairman and CEO. Ken Lewis was chairman and CEO. And on the, just after that shareholders meeting, when we were on our way back to the board meeting, which we were going to have afterwards, Ken Lewis, then CEO and chairman, pulled me aside and said the board uh, wanted me to uh, become their chairman. And I'm not going to use the word on the air that I said in the book. <laughs> it's an expletive, and it was total shock to me. And in fact, I argued that this was not the right decision, that I wasn't a banker, and so forth. And he said the board really thought I could do it, I was respected et cetera, the things they knew working with me. And I was well known in Washington from other things and so forth. And I thought, well, okay, uh, I can do it. It's actually an honor. And I'd been on boards where they had non-executive chairmen. So I knew what a non-exec chairman did. You convened the meetings, you presided over board meetings, you worked with management, you were in charge of the agenda for board meetings. You were a spokesperson when called up on about two days a week. You could do it. That was in, I could go from Chicago to Charlotte. A day after this happened, I got a call from the Federal Reserve in Washington telling me to go to Charlotte to meet with the head of the Federal Reserve in, Charlotte, in Richmond, which is the headquarters of the Fed branch that oversees us. And there I learned that it wasn't going to be a part-time job that the bank, they thought the bank had a number of issues that had to be uh, resolved. And the president of the bank, Richard Lacker, looked across the table at me and said, and Dr. Massey, the financial community, and we are going to be watching to see that you can get this done. It's a, so day afterwards, and then it became a full-time job. As you said, we had to reconstitute the board, we had to put in a management succession plan. We had to revise all our risk operations and a number of other things. And they said, you have, in addition to raising the money for the stress test and raising the money to pay back the TARP funds that the government had loaned up. So it was, I can't say any one thing stood out. The thing that I most personally had uh, uh, that fell upon me I had four other colleagues working with me on a special committee and we parsed out the responsibility. But I had to speak with our existing board members and tell some of them I would like their resignation. And these are people I'd worked with for years, colleagues. But I also asked them, I, please don't resign now. 
don't resign en masse because that really would, uh, I think, been very bad news in the financial community. So de dealing with them personally, and they all were mostly very cooperative, not all. That was the most difficult, and I think very emotional uh, aspect of all of this for me. Hmm. Thank you. Um, so throughout the book, Walter, you, you reference several boards you've served on, um, you know, both public and private. Um, and while you detail some of the perks at, that we all think about, in particular, I'm fond of getting the president's suite for U.S. Tennis Open games. I know that was a particularly um, a tantalizing tidbit for you. But why do you feel generally board service is an important part of uh, a professional's portfolio? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. One, I think boards are, are very important because for corporate America, boards, publicly traded company boards are required. And you have a board consisting of independent directors, those who are not working for employees of the company or management. Uh, and to represent the shareholders, so a legal fiduciary, but also boards are there not just as a legal fiduciary, but also to work with management, to advise management on their strategic planning, their long range objectives, and a number of other things. And someone has to do that, so it's important that people do it. I also thank boards for universities, you know, trustees of boards, very similar of concerns and responsibilities, but you actually, you are serving. And even for small not-for-profits, boards are necessary. Now, of course, for corporate boards, you do get paid and, and sometimes quite generously. So that is a income uh, from, from that service. Now for me, I've just learned so much uh, and I like to learn new things, uh, being on boards. I've, I've learned a lot about uh, uh, management and leadership that uh, I carried back to my uh, entities where I was a CEO or senior officer at the time. And I found that some of the issues uh, are sort of that entities have are very, very much independent of size. I would go to a meeting of uh, British Petroleum in London, you know, one of the world's largest corporations, and come back for my senior staff meeting at Morehouse College, a budget of a little over $100 million. And I would tell them what we're discussing and we'd have some of the same issues. It's just a lot to do with people. A lot of things have to do with people, siloing and organizations, communications, leadership styles, and also budget planning and management. But in addition to that kind of learning, if you're on a, a, a multinational board, everything a global board. Everything that happens in the world can affect the company. So you just read. I, you read everything. There's some, something that's going to happen in Kazakhstan. It's going to affect BP. Something's going to happen in China affects Bank of America. So you, I found myself in a, a situation where in the morning I'd read back we had newspapers. <laughs> right. Three or four newspapers, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, the times and so forth, and you'd listen to the news. So I was constantly learning. I just, I just felt very engaged in the world. So it was a growing and learning experience for me. I think there's important uh, things you learn. If you're in a business community, as many of you who are listening, you make wonderful connections, of course, at every level. And if you're on a major board of a, board of a major, as I said, global corporation, you make these kind of connections globally, which is rewarding personally and it can be very rewarding professionally. Um, as a sort of uh, solitary individual who loved theoretical physics and loved focusing uh, just in a solitary manner on that discipline uh, as really one of the things, one of the defining aspects of your young life. Um, what kind of skills did you pick up from that that you found surprisingly useful when you were uh, uh, on uh, uh, some, of the, some of these major 
uh, business boards that you were part of? Well, I found I, that some of those skills were useful even before I became, became very involved in the business community. My first experience in management was at Brown University when I became dean of the college there. I had maybe about 100 or so people reporting to me. And up to that time, I'd had run research programs and a program I had at Brown to sort of educate students for science, to be science teachers in inner, inner city schools. So I had, I had to learn how to deal a lot with people. And that was, uh, I shouldn't say it was difficult, but something that grew because as you noted from reading my book, others won't know, one of the re reasons I went into theoretical physics, not even experimental physics, because it's something you could do by yourself. Right. And I, I just really liked the solitary time of getting deeply involved in a problem and working through it late at night when Shirley and the kids, Shirley and my wife had uh, gone to bed. Shirley was very, very helpful in, um, in having me develop into a person who became a more people person because she's very outgoing. And as a couple, <laughs> as you would know, would know that. So at, at, at Brown, you know, I became more, I found out I enjoyed working with people. And I found that people really enjoyed working with me and that people enjoyed working for me. And looking back now, I can see that was something I think maybe that the personality trait I developed, but also I began to analyze it and, and began to see what is it that I was doing that allowed me to gather good people around me who liked working for me and to create good team. Now on the physics side, uh, I, I think I say somewhere in the book, when you're attacking, attacking a physics problem, a very complex, complicated problem, you can't see to the end. I mean, you may have some idea, but you have to kind of trust that you have to get started and you know where to start and you know the rules of the game and you began to do it sort of step by step with the kind of, it shouldn't say faith, believing that if you do this step right, that next step right, you just keep doing it and you stay within the parameters that you're going to finally come out at an answer. And I'd be the one you're looking for was you are. So I found like the Bank of America, when we came out of uh, the meeting with the Fed and people will read the book, it was my, my team and I, we were very shocked what we were, at what we were told by the Fed and what they expected us to do. And we had no grand plan <laughs> to do all that. But as I say, my first thought, well, we just have to get organized. We have to get organized. We have to do the first. Let's, let's just figure out what we have to do first. Let's do that. And then, so that's, I think that was part of my physics training. I'm sure people, other people do that same thing because of other reasons. But I think I've learned that through physics. Yeah. Also, physics, like many subjects, uh, it, it's uh, not an easy uh, a topic. It's not an easy science. So I gained a lot of confidence in myself and my ability to learn from having mastered such a difficult subject. Well, you you faced a lot of challenges as a very as a young person. I think if my, if my memory recalls, you went off to to college on on scholarship as a teenager, right? And and these activities that you described at Brown. That happened in your early 30s, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, re you know, remarkable exposure for a young man. Um, how did how did you rise up to those various challenges at that age with not a lot of preparation? I also I point out in my introduction to the book that it could have been called a life of serendipity, <laughs> because many things that happened to me. Well, very unplanned. Well, becoming chairman of Bank of America was not planned, at least on my part. My going off to Morehouse College, I just turned 16, out of the 10th grade was not planned. Uh, that was a program the Ford Foundation sponsored nationally to look around the country to identify young people who might be able to go to college early. The program had as its thesis that the last two years of college were 
really not that useful for certain people. University of Chicago under Hutchins had the same theory. So I took an exam in, in Mississippi. It was a national exam. And I was chosen for this Ford Foundation scholarship to Morehouse. And that's how I went to college. So I was 16. I finished at 20, right? And I was a full professor in my early 30s at Brown. Uh, so some of these things happened. You know, I had to work. I don't mean they just fell out of the sky. But that was a good start. Morehouse College really was the basis for practically everything that happened to me afterwards. I really got a fantastic liberal education coming from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, a small town, total segre totally segregated in the 50s. It just opened up a new world to me. I had a wonderful physics teacher, Sabinus Hobart Christensen. So this white Danish guy from Harvard. Like many whites in those days, they wanted to do, do something and go back and help others that's fortunate. So he, they would go to these small black colleges in the South and teach. The, I, want, I was really concerned when I got to Morehouse because all the other people who were Ford scholars in my um, cohort, there were about 15 of us, most of them were from big cities, New York, Chicago, Dallas, New Orleans, Atlanta itself. And some had gone to private schools, one went to Andover. I mean, it was another world. I was so afraid. I called my mother and said, uh, I, would, I want to come home. She said, well, you can't do that. They wouldn't have given you the scholarship if you couldn't make it. But I was still so afraid. But in those days, they had uh, placement exams that the entire freshman class had to take to see which courses you should be placed in based on your aptitude and what you knew. And they put the results of the exam on the door of the freshman dorm and listed the ranked people who scored highest to lowest in numerical rank by name. Now you would never do that today. You wouldn't embarrass people like that. So it was sort of like one to 120. And I went over and looked at it and it went, I remember the number one, Philip Thompson, William Churchill. And number five, it said Walter Massett. I was dumbfounded, I was shocked. I, I just didn't believe it. And that was the first time in my life that I realized I might be smart. And yeah. after that, I really gained a confidence that, well, maybe I should be here and maybe I should, you know, I'm, I'm where I belong, I can do it. And with that attitude, you know, I went into the courses and uh, succeeded. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that launching pad. Um, the book details some of the prejudice you faced while growing up and your desire to leave the, quote, crushing racial atmosphere of the South. How do you think things have changed after all these years in Hattiesburg, Mississippi? Changed a great deal. <laughs> I went back for a high school reunion and three years ago, three years ago, but I had gone back periodically over the years. I even was given a key to the city when I was director of Argon, which was a big deal for me, you can imagine. Sure. I went back to a place where I had to drink out of colored water fountains and go in the back doors of most stores and take a fire escape to the back of the top of the to the balcony to go in movie theaters. So that was something. But then we had a uh, black mayor, Hattiesburg, for a number of years um, since I left. And things have changed a great, a great deal. There are still major problems, but when I see people, you know, younger people say, well, nothing has changed. It's just, oh, it's not true at all. I mean, things, we have major issues now, but things have changed a great deal in Hattiesburg and throughout the South, probably throughout the country, I should say, right? Yes. Well, here's one example, Walter. When a policeman killed your grandmother's dog because she wouldn't sell it to him, you discovered, quote, that there were evil white people whose power to commit atrocities was pretty much unlimited, unquote. What are your thoughts on how little that has changed throughout the decades as evidenced by the Black Lives Matter movement? Well, that is, that is so interesting, right? 
that parallel. They kill our dog, and for the readers, it was my grandmother's dog, but it was the dog, her name was Lady, I don't, I don't remember that. I'm told that um, she, they would, when they left me alone in my crib, that the dog would stay there. The dog was sort of my protector. And I don't remember a lot of the details. I do remember seeing her lying there in maggots shot. But this notion that there are certain people who seem to have unlimited power could kill a dog and I could just kill a human being. I mean, the, the parallels are eerie, as a matter of fact. And that's something that doesn't seem to have changed, but clearly it hasn't. Right, right. Well, as a professor at the University of Illinois, you became the Black Student Association faculty advisor and were instantly involved in racial issues. And you also gave up your job uh, at the University of California. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands that, you know, you were over the entire California system. Um, to take over as president of, of your beloved Morehouse College to help young black men. Um, what were some of the programs that you put in place along the way? And why is it important that black leaders like you make personal sacrifices for the racial justice movement? Well, I think not just black leaders, I think leaders of every ethnic and race group should take it upon themselves to be a force in trying to provide for racial equity and racial equity and social justice especially especially now of course if you're a black leader or a minority leader period it, maybe there's a bigger burden but i would hope everyone would see the necessity of that and sometimes people who are not african-american can make a big difference as i said my mentor, uh, the physics mentor was white. One of my most important mentors in my life is Hannah Gray, one of our other neighbors, former president of the University of Chicago, who was responsible for bringing me from Brown to back to Chicago to be director of Argo. So I think leaders and mentors are needed from all backgrounds. Now for me in Morehouse, uh, I, as you pointed out there, I was provost, which is the second command, provost and senior vice president for the system. And I had been recruited by the president, then Jack Peltison, who had said he was going to retire in a couple of years. And he, you know, no one can promise you you will succeed, but that would be the uh, uh, likely outcome, assuming I was successful. And by all indications, I had a very good chance. And probably others have told me, even now recently, that I probably would have been chosen if I'd stayed there. But uh, when Morehouse wanted me to come back, and that's detailed in the book about why they wanted a new president and me, uh, we talked it over in the family with my sons and Shirley and just and other friends that we know around the uh, country. And the feeling was that I could do a, a make a bigger difference in the world by going back to Morehouse. Morehouse College, for people who don't know, it's the alma mater of Martin Luther King Jr. Small college, only about 25, 2600. All male, still one of the few all male, and has graduate, graduated some of the um, major leading figures in the, in the nation, not just in the African-American community. So I thought, and we all thought going back there, I could, if I could do something to improve, it was a good school, if I could improve that, then the outcome would, um, for the good of society would be better. That other people could probably do the University of California job, uh, but that might be a special place for me. And it was the best decision we ever made. I mean, we graduated about over 5,000 African-American males, you know, who all most have gone on to important leadership or scientific position in the country. I have, I have never met a Morehouse graduate, friend, business uh, colleague, lawyer, doctor, that does not say, do you know Walter Massey? 
right? So I, I, I know you had a powerful impact on, on, those, on those young men. Um, in the book, you encourage everyone to be courageous when considering a new barrier breaking path in life. Is that advice still applicable during the pandemic or is now the time to sort of stay put? And if you're staying put, what can you do to improve your, your life while you're staying put? You've held many prestigious positions throughout your lifetime. President of Morehouse College, director of the National Science Foundation, director of Argonne National Laboratories, and provost of the University of California State System, as we were just discussing. Yet you also enjoyed your family, played tennis, exercised, and traveled ex extensively. How do you maintain a good work balance, a good marriage, and what is the secret of your success uh, on outside of the boardroom? Well, I talk about it in the book. I don't think I can. Uh, love is one. I think I'm meeting my meeting wife, my wife Shirley. We, uh, this year, the last month was our 51st anniversary. Very, I've been very fortunate in that regard, and I learned that uh, I cannot really do the kind of work that I've been doing since I stopped doing that solitary theoretical physics unless I have other things. It, dealing with uh, people uh, running an organization really requires a kind of focus and, and use of energy, I think, that you really need to renew. You, if, because you, your attitude and how you behave in an organization, especially if you're in a leadership position, is really, uh, something that other people look to. You may not realize it, and I, I didn't either until later on when I was in leadership position, of how little things that you do and the way you behave, where you carry yourself and so forth are so important. So to keep that balance, I've, one, for me, I suffer from high blood pressure and high cholesterol. The exercise and those other things are just so important in that regard. But having a balanced life also allows you, you then to trans, I think, translate that back into your behavior on the job. I have to tell you a story I just thought of, which was one when it first came to me that uh, what you do, the little things are so important. When I first came back to Chicago to be director of Argonne, and I said, came back because my first job as a scientist was at Argonne. Uh, and then I went off to Brown and other places. I, they had an event a little dinner and they had dessert and I said, oh, you have cheesecake. And at that time, I can't eat cheese now. I love cheesecake. I said, oh, I'd love this cheesecake. I'll have the cheesecake. We had the dinner uh, a week or so later and they served cheesecake. Every lunch and dinner, they had cheesecake. And finally I asked Marie, I remember who was my uh, sister. I said, why do they serve cheesecake all the time? She said, don't you know? I said, well, I said, because you said you liked cheesecake that time. I said, I didn't mean you served it all the time. <laughs> I've had other instances, and I'm, you may have too. You have to be careful what you do, what you say, because people are watching you. That's a trivial example, but it's, I think, a, a very uh, informative one. OK, so everybody write down. Uh, truer words were never spoken. People are watching you. Yeah. I think with, with that, Walter, let's switch over. And, and we have uh, uh, several questions from our colleagues that are listening in. Um, and, and let me ask you some of these because they're very thoughtful uh, questions. Jeremy Overfield uh, asked the following questions. Walter, with your experience in higher education leadership, what's your take on the future of for-profit education in higher education, both large online university and smaller vocational colleges, and what role do they will they play in society? Not sure. It's an interesting question. I think a, a great deal is going to depend on the 
government government regulations and government posture. As you ask that, you may know that uh, under the past administration of Obama, they were beginning to really put in stricter regulations and guidance and rules for for profit uh, organizations. And this administration, under Secretary DeVos, began to loosen some of those. And that's been good. You see the stock has gone up in some of those companies. You know, the, the basic model, and this is not everyone, but it is mostly for, for profits, is they recruit heavily market to, comp to students, it could be young or old, of their programs. The, the, the clientele of almost overwhelmingly individuals who rely on government uh, uh, loans or Pell grants or government grants. And so that money goes directly to the institution. It just passes through the student, so to speak. And to the, so the government can put in regulations to affect whether or not that model is going to be profitable. Now, the University of Phoenix, for example, is, from everything I can find, seems to have found a sweet spot in this not-for-profit, in this for-profit world. It was a huge organization. The new uh, president and CEO of the Museum of Science and Industry graduated from the University of Phoenix and went on to get graduate degrees. And I know other people who have. So it can be done. I think going through the experience we are all going through as an example of what we're doing tonight, learning how to use technology for remote teaching could possibly be a boom to these institutions because many of them already uh, heavily use online uh, teaching. Yeah, that's a that's very thoughtful. That's ex that, that that's exactly right. Um, we got a question from Walter Roberts, uh, which I think is interesting. Walter, what can business leaders do to inform the public of the need for equality and social justice in daily business activities? What are the sort of appropriate programs that you think make the most sense? There's a lot floating around there now. Well, I think the first thing they have to do is demonstrate through their own action and in their organization that they have a concern for equality and social justice, and not just through philanthropic programs, which are very important, investing in, uh, as many organizations are doing, investing in minority businesses or in activities outside of their operation. But I also mean having proven inside their companies that serve as examples and also speaking about them. And two people I've, I've been very impressed with is uh, Tom Wilson, the CEO of uh, Allstate. And what he is, speaks about is they're trying to do inside the company uh, and Brian Moynihan at Bank of America. Also, if you read some of Brian's letters, and Brian was chairman of the business roundtable, and so was Tom, I think, before he was down. And they have really been writing and speaking about how we, there's a need to reconsider capitalism in a time when uh, for profit organizations have to move beyond just the return to shareholder model and be more cognizant of their responsibility to the community and to their associates. Um, I haven't, I don't know how, where this will go and you know whether this will, I hope it's, a, it's not a blip, but I recall back when I first went on the Motorola board in the early 1980s, Bob Galvin, who became one of my a role model to me, his family founded Motorola. Right. And he was, and they were the largest shareholders then, but he would always stress when he was chairman that the company had a responsibility to its stakeholders, not just his shareholders, the community in which they uh, resided, the employees, as well as the, uh, as the shareholders. And you will know, Scott, maybe others who, I don't mean you are that old, <laughs> but you study it, that that was not uncommon in many corporations you know, whether they lived up to it or not, one can argue, but at least that was the philosophy. And then we went through or still in to a large extent, an era where shareholder returns topped everything, 
trump everything you know and i think you know the private equity and hedge funds who are able to control companies i won't go into all of that but i think it's changed i've been interested to see the letters that lawrence fink you know ceo of blackrock has been writing companies in which they invest about how they're going to be very serious about holding companies uh, to task for how they consider the environment, uh, sustainability, and equity in their operation. So things may be may be changing to the to the I think to the best to the better. Frankly. Well, yes, me me too. Um, so we had an interesting question from Vikram Subramanian. Um, going by the election results, Walter, the country seems to be pretty divided right now. What would you advise the incoming president to do to bridge the divide? Well, I think President-elect Biden is really doing exactly the right thing now. You know, he's really, his first speech is all about healing and bringing the country together. And so I think the rhetoric he's using is exactly the kind of rhetoric. He worked in Congress for a number of years, as we know, and was well known for working across the aisle. Of course, many people were in the quote old days, but he's, he still has friends and colleagues in the Republican Party, uh, including the, um, the Republican Party leader. So maybe one can have some hope that he'll be able to at least bridge this gap in, in, some, uh, in some small manner. But I think style matters. You know, we've talked some of the aspects of that earlier, you know, just by being a leader in any organization. Leaders matter, I believe, and what they say and what they do and their character and their words and their rhetoric matter. And I, I'm very pleased that he's, I think, off to a good start, as I say, and at least in, in terms of things he is saying, he is saying. Yeah, yeah, that's very thoughtful. Um, so we had another one from, from Warren Walker and Warren asked, uh, Walter, do you think, think in a capitalist system, it's appropriate for the federal government to provide assistance to save companies slash industries that without that assistance would fail due to their own actions or perceived actions? That's a, well, that's an interesting question. And particularly uh, given the person who I'm interviewing. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll put it like this. I don't think there's anything in the definition of theory, uh, economic theory of capitalism that would forbid not allow the federal government or the government period to intervene in, uh, in a time when there's a major national crisis. And this doesn't mean that that should be a ongoing or continuous form of government business interaction. And you always have that slippery slope, you know, fear. But it's like when in a time of national security, you don't go to war all the time. You wouldn't want that, but of course, the government has the right and has to do that. The question is, is it a matter of uh, such national importance that it overrides you know, some theory about how capitalism works? And do you have the people who have the right judgment? And that's what you hopefully you do, who have the right judgment and prudence in making that decision. So if the, I don't think that should be a sort of a staple of a government of course but i think for one who was really inside of this crisis in the last last decade that the country would be much worse off much if there hadn't been those interventions by uh, hank Paulson, and tim geithner and others at the top now some dispute that but most of the even the histories and analysis that I've read, uh, I think the people who were inside and even who, those who weren't economists would agree. Some disagree with that, but I feel very strongly about it. There, you ask, 
you didn't ask, you said, what was the most, some of the most difficult things I had to do at that time? You didn't ask what, what are the things that I feared the most. And I know others who I've spoken with feared most that we'd have a collapse of the financial system, not just Bank of America, but of the national financial system. And who knows what that would have led to. As I say, some people don't believe that. Some think we should have just let the banks collapse as we did Lehman Brothers. By the way, I should say also that uh, people who haven't been following, you know, all of the funds that the federal government uh, put in to bail out financial institutions were all paid back with interest and the government made a profit. Right, right. Well, federalism was built to take care of crises first and foremost. And uh, so I'm not at all surprised by your, your answer. Here, here's an important one and um, uh, an interesting question by, by Lee Blackwell. He, he wonders, Walter, how do you see investment in environmental impact investing occurring? And should profit be important in that sector? Well, I'm not giving investment advice, that's for sure. Well, no, no, we're not asking for any investment advice here. I try to avoid, right, don't right, ask me right. for investment advice either. I'm just thinking about, right. um, you know, the notion that the environment is taking on greater and greater importance and how can, how can we go about, I think the process of, of supporting initiatives uh, in the environment and, and investing uh, in that sector. Oh, I see. First, I really, you can uh, think, would recommend that people who are interested in that read some of Larry Fink's uh, letters to companies he invested in. And you can go online and just look up uh, the letters on sustainability. And he, of course, I mean, BlackRock, he, it's not a not-for-profit op operation. But, so he points out the sort of financial incentives for companies to be concerned with uh, environmental issues and environmental impact. So and I think people at the top of the financial industry see that. And we can see, I think, in other areas, Ford Motor Company announced today, maybe they've done it before, that they will phase all of their vehicles from cars to trucks to everything will be electric by 2035. I mean, they're just saying that this is the end of the fossil, the gas driven uh, uh, automobile of uh, motor vehicle. So they obviously see a profit uh, in that regard. And, you know, clearly there are companies that see very well that being able to be concerned about the environment and make a profit is something that's doable. Maybe, maybe not in the short term, but certainly for those entities and industries, companies that are looking for the long term, that seems to be settling in as they thought uh, now that 10 years ago, I think you would have had much more arguments about. Right. Yeah, self-interest rightly understood, I think that Tocqueville said about that. And that, that's very interesting that Ford's taking on that initi initiative. Um, Jeanette Wong, Walter, asked the following question. Uh, how did the board help you and management in thinking through the crisis? In other words, was there a kitchen cabinet that you convened that was particularly helpful and were your go-to uh, people? Uh, were there missing skill gaps amongst those board members that you had to uh, uh, relieve of their responsibilities? And how did you choose new ones? My kitchen cabinet was something we call the special committee. And, and that's with myself, which I chair it, and the four other directors who went to Richmond with me at that first meeting with the Fed. And it's too much to go into now, but I did, you know, uh, 
speak about in detail how we that came about. So yes, that was this kitchen cabinet. The uh, we were told by the Fed that we needed more banking and financial expertise on the board. Now we had a very solid board, good board, but we had people like myself who were not a banker. We had an admiral, a four-star general, head of uh, public broadcasting. You know, we, good people who had business and other leadership experience, but not really in-depth banking experience. So part of what we did was to bring more people on the board with who had had real banking. They'd either been in the banking sector, run banks, or been like we brought on Don Powell, who was a former head of the OCC, or knew the regulatory environment. So that was some of the reasons, uh, the way, the motivation for restructuring the board. I see. I see. My goodness, we're sort of at the end of our program here. Mm. Um, I just want to hold this up right here. I want you to know that I uh, couldn't sleep a couple nights and uh, this didn't help because I started reading this at one o'clock in the morning and finished at 7 a.m. So I would encourage everybody to go out uh, and buy Walter's book, In the Eye of the Storm, My Time as Chairman of Bank of America during the country's worst financial crisis. Um, please join me in thanking Walter Massey, who's a wonderful guy, for sharing his remar remarkable story with us and warm wishes to all of you for a very happy holiday season. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. I'll see you soon, I hope. I do too. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. In person. Give my best to Shirley. I Thank will. You. Thank you.